So it um, is a pleasure to welcome our keynote speaker for this morning actually back to Halifax because he is originally from the Maritimes, from New Brunswick. However, Dr. Peter Zed has decided to explore the other coast of Canada and he's now an Associate Professor and Associate Dean for Practice Innovation at the Faculty of Pharmaceutical Sciences and also an Associate Member of the Department of Emergency Medicine at the University of British Columbia. As you can see by his biography, which is in your program, he's very actively involved in both teaching and research. And the topic on which he's going to present has certainly been a major area of interest for him, particularly in terms of his uh, research. And he is, as you can see, going to present on when does an adverse drug event become an emergency? Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Milken, and, and thanks to the organizers of, the, of this uh, great conference for the uh, invitation and the opportunity to come home and uh, see my mom. She thanks you for uh, bringing me home um, to see her. I spent a couple of days in New Brunswick prior to coming here, so it's truly an honor to be uh, invited to be the keynote speaker this morning for, for this, uh, this conference, and um, I'm going to present to you today something that's, that's clearly been near and dear to my heart with regards to my research program and, and really something that's evolved from my practice in emergency medicine. I continue to practice in emergency medicine at, at Vancouver General. Um, when I was here, I was, I was at, the, at the infirmary and had the very great opportunity to do a research study here with the crew at the IWK, which I'll show you today around adverse events in kids. And so what this will not be is me showing you a series of monographs of adverse events of psychiatric, psychotropic medications because you all know that. You all know those things. What I'm going to give you today is a perspective on how to think a little bit about adverse events and from a, from a much broader perspective. The patients that we all care for, even patients with mental illness, are more likely to have an adverse event from their non-mental illness related medication. That's been shown by a couple of different groups. It's slightly higher that your risk of having an adverse event in the mental health population is not to come from their, their mental health medications. And that was a surprise to me. Um, what also is clear in, in digging in and preparing for this very specialized group and focus for this conference, there's very little out there that really focuses in on really understanding the impact of adverse events in mental illness. And for those of you in the, in the audience that have an interest in this area and exploring it further, it certainly is one that deserves more attention to better understand some of the things that we now understand in general practice, general medicine, family practice for common chronic diseases, but we don't have that same understanding for mental illness and, and the use of those drugs, despite the fact that we all well know that each of these medications is not clean from an adverse event perspective and patients do experience adverse events um, when they take these medications. So when does an adverse event become an emergency? It will be broad and I'll tie in some of the non-psychotropic non types of medication adverse events and some of the things to consider that may that nicely fit into some of the, the, the discussion that we just had around access and consideration of how patients are triaged because oftentimes we'll see patients present with acute delirium, acute uh, decompensation in, in, in the presence or in the absence of a history of mental, mental illness and in fact it has nothing to do with their mental illness. It's a medication that is causing a psychosis or a delirium that the patient is presenting with and it's not a medical diagnosis. Um, it's like, um, it's like a psychiatric issue that must be addressed. I have no financial disclosures uh, or conflicts of interest to declare for this talk, and I will certainly come at this from the perspective of a, a practitioner in emergency medicine and, and not one that has the vast experience that many of you have dealing daily with your patients with mental illness. Um, I attempt to accomplish three objectives today. One is to talk a little bit about the overall impact of adverse events in our system, uh, talk about a little bit about factors patients, drugs that place p people at risk for adverse events and throughout there weave in as much as we do know, what little we know about the, the specifics around 
psychiatric medications and adverse events and the risk factors that are uh, associated with that group uh, of medications. And then finally, discuss strategies that we can all use, regardless of what hat we wear when we care for patients, what hat we wear when we are administrators um, or educators. But there's many things that this very complex area um, we can start to consider to try to get at preventing these events. When I first got into this area, my, my original interest was not about the epidemiology of adverse events. It was really about trying to make a difference to prevent them from happening. And my observation in my practice was that each day I'd go home at the end of a shift and I'd say, there, there was a whole bunch of patients I saw today that were just here in the immersion department because of something wrong with their meds. And when you start to look at trying to figure out, well, let's try to figure out a way to prevent these from happening, what was very obvious 10 years ago when I started to embark in this area as a researcher was that there was very little known in Canada about the impact of adverse events, regardless of the patient population in Canada. And so I have spent a large part of the last decade trying to explore epidemiology, and only now am I starting to explore that what I'm really interested in, which is to get at the interventions to prevent these from happening. I'm going to present a series of cases today, and I've, I, I have a whole series of cases, as you can imagine, from the, the work that I do clinically and research-wise, and I've, I've selected three cases today that I'll, I'll sprinkle in throughout the talk. Um, two of them are actually from cases that happened while I was here in Halifax uh, for the five-year period and working at the infirmary. And this first case is not a case that has anything to do with mental illness, but it actually is a case that, like many of these cases that you'll see, and you will say to yourselves, how did this happen? How could this possibly have happened? But they, all these cases are real that I'm going to show you today. 67-year-old female was brought into the ED by her husband, um, retired nurse, very aware of her, of her health. Um, which complained of nausea and vomiting. Patient began experiencing nausea two weeks prior, um, but over the past three days had increased vomiting with dehydration, uh, described an eight pound weight loss, complaints of mild epigastric pain, cramps in the lower extremities, and exper had experienced these in the past, but had gotten worse over the past six weeks. She's also complained of fatigue and increased weakness. Past history is significant primarily for cardiovascular disease, um, has a number of drug intolerances, and a quite extensive medication list. Um, I shouldn't say quite extensive because that's actually probably not extensive in this current day practice. Um, but I'll leave that up there for just a second, and I know this is not the perfect venue for discussion, but has anybody seen anything weird on the med list? Resuvastatin dose, double, double what the current recommended maximal dose is for this drug class. Now this patient, when you look at this patient, she's not in acute distress. She's just fed up with the symptoms that she's been experiencing and appear to be worsened. Um, and so in a typical eMERGE setting, she gets a full panel of lab results that come back. And this is what comes back, hyperkalemic, acute renal failure, tra elevated transaminases, a CK and a myoglobin there through the roof. Now this is, a, this is a classic, everyone knows type of adverse event in a very commonly used drug class in every patient population. Statin-induced myopathies, myalgias, very common. Statin-induced rhabdomyolysis, an acute hepatotoxicity, not so common, but obviously quite dangerous. And this patient, interestingly enough, had it happen to her using a drug at a dose that was never intended for it to be used. And if you look at statin-induced myopathies, this is a graph that shows the, the changes of the likelihood of the patient having an elevated CK of 10,000, 10 times the upper limit of normal based on the dosing increments of the various statin drugs, you can see there's a, there's a correlation between as you increase dose, the likelihood of this happening does go up. And you can see a drug called Cervastatin or Baycol was a drug that was removed from market because the rate of CK elevation in this patient population was much higher than the rest of the statins and it was removed from market for this, for this reason. Resuvastatin at the dose that you saw this patient take was studied. And it was found that the rate of CK elevation was exactly the same as was experienced with the drug that was removed from market. But it was used in this patient. 
And so this is not, there's, there's hopefully when you, this, this patient ended up getting about a month of dialysis and to this day um, remains with acute kidney injury and renal insufficiency. Um, became an advocate for adverse events and worked with me over the five years that I was here on, on the patient's perspective of what can go, what can happen when something goes wrong with your medications and spoke at events just like this from the patient's perspective of this experience. And, I, and I, I know this is not a mental health or a psychiatric related issue, but hopefully you're all sitting there saying, how could this possibly have happened? How did it get prescribed? How did it get filled? How did it actually get taken and not monitored? And I'll come back to this case at the very end because it really encompasses a lot of the things to consider as we try to get at that prevention piece of adverse drug events. So let's talk, talk a little bit about adverse events and, and the impact. And before we get going, I think it's, it's very important to talk about some definitions so that we're all speaking the same language, because this is an area that has had definition uh, and, and terminology that have changed over time. The, most of us, when we think of adverse drug events, we actually think of adverse drug reactions. And an adverse drug reaction are, are those typical things that happen with a drug that is used, the undesirable effect of a drug that's used in doses at humans for treatment or prophylaxis. And it's the things, the nausea, the vomiting, the diarrhea, the things that we all know can happen when patients use drugs for an indication at the correct dose. But that excludes many of the things that we would all typically encompass when we talk about drug misadventure. If a patient's non-compliant with their medication and the patient has an illness that's not treated or it becomes decompensated, then that's an adverse event. The patient actually has not taken the medication as prescribed and as a result has not attained the benefit of it. The same thing with issues of drug interactions, dosing alterations, errors. Um, they're all things that are considered that are, should be encompassed in a broader definition of adverse drug events. And so the bottom definition is something that you'll hear about today and what I will talk about is not just adverse drug reactions but just any misadventure that can occur with the use or misuse of medications. There is a classification for this. It really is prominent in the, in the pharmacy practice uh, world and research, but there's a Hapler and Strang classification that we utilize in, in our thinking around figuring out what can go wrong with a medication and the eight classifications that, that you can see here. Doesn't matter whether we're, we're reading medical literature, but today t there's lots that is out there in the, in the lay public and press around adverse drug-related events. And for that reason alone, your patients will inquire to you about what they've read and what they've seen. And Googling things is norm commonplace for everyone these days, and you, you will get questions and as healthcare providers need to respond to those inquiries. So usually when I'm preparing for, for a talk in this nature, I'll, I will Google the news and find out what's current day, and it doesn't take very long to find pieces that are out there in the last seven days that are talk about adverse drug-related events. Um, and there's, there's, there's many here, and they're just there for illustrative purposes. Prescription meds can cause un unwanted pounds. This, that particularly talked about some of the metabolic effects of some of the new second-generation antipsychotics. Uh, extremes of age have made the news uh, recently with drug reactions sending lots of seniors to hospital, uh, pediatric adverse events, which was some press that our study got that was done here at the IWK. Uh, last month uh, when it was published. This is an interesting headline. Um, we're all well aware of the opioid uh, issues that we have in our country and, and elsewhere. And I think Dr. Gosselin's gonna talk a little bit more about that this afternoon. Um, and the interesting thing about this headline is, is that for some reason, the health plan in Ontario is being criticized for funding this killer drug. Um, but every single health plan in the world covers opioid analgesics for uh, medication. It's nothing to do with the health plan. It's the manner in which the patients were receiving and certainly at the ex excessive doses that have been received that have resulted in increased uh, signals of, of bad outcomes in patients receiving opioids. And certainly in magazines, there's a couple of uh, recent magazine issues of the scientists and the walrus uh, that have focused on adverse events and medical error that um, certainly bring light to this very, very popular and common issue. In Canada, our most recent numbers, and this isn't well studied, one of the things I can't show you today is, is really accurate economic implications of adverse drug events. But in 2013, our health care costs were about $211 billion. Um, we spent about just uh, $34.5 billion on drugs. 
um, which is an increase of about three and a half billion from the three years prior. Um, and it's been estimated through a series of modeling that we spend in our country about $21 billion a year just managing adverse drug events. And that's healthcare costs, that's things such as lost productivity as a result of adverse events that patients experience, but about $21 billion. No small amount of money that's certainly being spent on managing adverse drug events. Regardless of where you practice, this is a, a picture, pictorial that talks about the continuum of care as patients may traverse from their home uh, with acute illness, may end up in an emergency department, come into an inpatient environment, hopefully go back home. And in that middle ground, we have ambulatory and outpatient care that patients will spend most of their time um, as, as outpatients uh, working with their family health care teams or family physicians um, and other health care providers in the community. Adverse events can happen in all these areas. And 10 years ago, if I were to show you this picture, I would be able to fill in no, no data to describe what the impacts were in Canada. And the, there's a, I'm going to walk you through a series of studies. I'm only going to show you Canadian data. And I'm not going to spend a ton of time on each study, but just to impress upon you that the rates of adverse events throughout our system are much higher than I anticipated when I started working in this area, and probably much higher than you anticipate um, sitting here today. Um, this is a drug-related hospitalization study that looked at all hospital admissions to an internal medicine service um, and found that t a quarter of all the patients sitting in that inpatient bed in internal medicine were there because of an adverse drug event. And if you look at the types, um, the very first type is the adverse drug reaction, the pure adverse drug reaction type. It only made up 35%. So two-thirds of the events were things that had nothing to do with just the typical ADRs. It was issues with the wrong drug, the wrong dose, compliance issues, um, being using drugs for a, a situation where there's no indication to use drugs, drug interactions. And 72% of these were preventable. And that number will become a recurring theme as we go through. This is one of our first emergency studies. Um, and I'll come back to the study a few times because it does have some nice pearls specific to the mental health uh, related issues. Um, this was a study that was done in Vancouver, Vancouver General, where we looked at all emergency department visits um, over a period of, of a time in, in about just over 1,000 patients that were prospectively randomized and selected and found that 12% of all the ED visits were adverse drug-related events. Uh, again, a 68% preventability rate. And again, you can see that ADR is only made up about 39% of the events themselves. So a lot of the events were actually caused by other causes. Interestingly enough, surprise finding in this study is that if you were there for a non-adverse drug-related visit, your rate of admission was about 21%. But if you were there with an ADR, your rate of admission almost doubled to 36%. So not only that, you spent a median of three and a half days longer in hospital. So the resources consumed by this particular patient population are, again, significant. And this was a surprise finding. We did not expect to see this when we described the disposition of our patients but it is, was reproduced even to a more marked effect when we looked at the pediatric population, as you'll see in a second. In, emerged, in psychiatric presentations or psychiatric medication adverse events that emerge, there's very little out there. And I, and I show you this, this one study um, with reluctance because this particular group, uh, sorry, not the group, but the particular methodology that's used in this study has historically shown that the rates are very, very much underrepresented on what we actually see. And so this is a retrospective um, database uh, study where that you looked at patients that present in the US over a two-year period from 2009 to 2011 to figure out if the patients were coded in their electronic health system as being there because of an adverse event related to their psychiatric medications. And just to give you a sense of how underrepresented these numbers have typically historically shown is that when you do these same studies in the same populations but do them through prospective design, you end up finding rates that are eight to tenfold higher than what you see in administrative database work. And as a researcher in this area, it's very clear to see why. It's because some of these events, you cannot ascertain at the point in time you see them in a merge. And you require follow-up, test challenge, de-challenge, a whole series of things to actually figure out if that presentation was truly an adverse event or not. And the other is just the inherent challenges with charting in an electronic health record where an adverse event that may be the cause of their visit is not charted as an adverse event. 
it's charted as heart failure exacerbation, and it's not charted as heart failure exacerbation because the patient just got started on an NSAID and caused fluid retention. So it's very difficult in these admin database work to ascertain this, this issue. But this study, there's a, and there's a typo on this slide, that's supposed to be, there's an extra digit uh, after the comma, but it's 89,000, just over 89,000 ADRs, ED visits annually that are related to psychiatric medications in this group. Uh, but almost half between the ages of 19 and 44, and t just over 19% were admitted to hospital. And again, I'll come back to this work with the, with the limitations I've just described, because it is really the only epidemiologic study that's out there that describes adverse events in, the, in psychiatric medications. The Canadian Adverse Events Study looks at patients that had adverse events while admitted to hospital. 7.5% of all patients have an adverse event while in hospital, caused by things that we do to treat them appropriately, but they experience adverse events. And then finally, the last piece, Alan Forrester's group in Ottawa looked at post-discharged adverse events. So we all discharge our patients back into the community and hope that nothing goes wrong. Um, and we all know that that's not always the case. In this particular study, 23% of patients had an adverse drug event within 30 days of being discharged, half of them preventable. And you can see the impact. Most of these are lab abnormalities, transient symptoms, abnormalities with their labs, but some of them, 3% had a permanent disability, and 3% died in this patient population because of that adverse event. And the healthcare resource utilization was again prominent in this group. 17% were admitted, readmitted, 12% ended up coming back to the ED. So resource consumer as well. So now when you fill in the numbers, this is what it looks like. And so adverse events, it doesn't matter where you practice. And these, these, a lot of these studies, with the exception of that, that one study that did focus on, on psychiatric medications, does have a mix of patients that come in from communities that have mental illness or not, but these rates of adverse events are significant. And the preventability rates that we see are consistently between 50 and 70%. So opportunities for a whole series of healthcare providers, pharmacists, physicians, nurses, social workers, to actually try to get at some of the issues to prevent these events, which we'll come to at the end. What about kids? This is an area that's very poorly studied. Um, and I was very fortunate when I was here, and thanks to the support of the Nova Scotia Health Research Foundation and a great team of, of clinicians at the IWKED. Um, we collaborated. You'll see some of the, the people in this author list that you'll recognize, Karen Black, Eleanor Fitzpatrick, Doug Sinclair, uh, Janet Cran, all were co-investigators on this project. But we attempted to replicate the adult study in pediatrics and figure out what was the rate of ED presentation for adverse drug events in kids. As an investigative team, a little out there, we actually assumed it would be about three to four percent. We thought it would be very small. It actually turned out to be eight percent. Eight percent of all the visits at the IWKED, these were all comers, prospectively randomized for selection. Eight percent were drug-related, 65 percent preventable, and you can see only a quarter of them were ADRs. There was a population that was across the board with things like dosing issues, adherence issues, um, being on the wrong drug, using drugs that they shouldn't be using, not for overdose indication, but for just using drugs that they should never have been using. And again, the disposition piece was more pronounced. If you were there for an adverse drug event, you got admitted 27% of the time. If you weren't there with an adverse drug event, you only got admitted 5% of the time. And when you were admitted, you spent a day and a half longer in the hospital. So again, a resource consumer. So drugs are, are a, da a bit of a dangerous game, and we all, it, particularly in patients that are treated for mental illness, pharmacotherapy is a big part of the treatment armamentarium that we use, like many other chronic diseases. Um, but it comes with it some risk. And I would argue a, a risk that we need to try to tackle as a system to try to deal with minimizing these events from happening and redeploying those valuable healthcare resources that are spent on adverse drug events to other forms of, uh, of care to ultimately improve patient outcomes. Um, it's, it, this isn't, I've shown you all that's known about the psychiatric population, and it's an area that would be an awesome study to look at, a population of patients admitted for acute mental illness, and what is the relationship between that presentation and that admission? Does it actually have something to do with the, the, the medication, or is it something to do with the disease, or is it a combination? Um, a challenge, but an area of, uh, that, that needs further work. 
Let's shift gears a little bit and talk a little bit about the, the factors of, and the risks and the drug classes. And again, I'm going to present this um, from both a mental health perspective and a non-mental health perspective. Um, and interestingly enough, the, common, the six most common drug classes that cause, that consistently come out in adverse drug event work, in looking at general population, do not fall in the, in the psychiatric medication drug class. And part of that is related to the, the prevalence of use and the increased use of things like NSAIDs and antibiotics and anticoagulants, and more use equals more likelihood of having events. But I will show you some of the common trends that we've seen in some of the work we've done and what, again, little is out there describing the relative risks of psychotropic medications and what you can start to think about when you're exploring your patients and even seeing patients that are presented with potential del delusions, psychosis, that may not actually have a history of mental disease, but actually may have another cause that is another drug that's causing this presentation. I'll present this case, and I, I'm going to go back here before I present this case, because this is probably the audience that when I present this case, you guys are going to go, this is such, that's such a simple case. Because this is a well-known, this, this case is well-known. This case happened, and every single one of you in this room will know exactly what happened in this case within about, when I get to the second slide. So this, we'll go through it really quickly. 74-year-old male brought to the ED by uh, EHS. This is a case that actually happened at Vancouver General. Decreased LOC, drowsy with slurred speech. Uh, patient had been in the ED two days prior, uh, secondary to a fall and had rib, rib fractures. Um, was discharged on oral morphine at that time. Um, presented on this presentation with slurred speech, hallucinations, disorientation um, that began the evening of presentation. A history of bipolar disorder, hypothyroidism, and the recent rib fractures. And a medication uh, regimen with lithium olanzapine, phenylzine, levothyroxine, zopoclone, and morphine. I probably don't even have to turn the next slide for you to see what, what happened here in this case. Um, patient had an ED, uh, it was in the ED all night long had a CT of their head, nothing, which was completely normal. And as they sat in the eMERGE all night long, the patient's symptoms completely resolved with no care, just time. And it was decided at that time that the patient had actually presented with opioid-induced adverse events, the hallucinations, the slurred speech, was just a reflection of the opioids. And because they went away with really nothing else, that's what was thought to be the working, working reason for which they came. So a drug-related presentation in itself. The patient at the same time, though, was experiencing more pain. The family and the patient were adamant that they received no more morphine after being told that this was caused by your morphine. So the resident, and I'm not picking on residents, the resident ordered 75 milligrams of imaparidine for this patient. And 17 minutes after the dose was given, the patient became agitated, diaphoretic, hyperthermic, hypotensive, increasingly rigid, thought to have a seizure, had acute um, hypotension, was intubated, was given phenytoin uh, for thought that of a possible seizure. And I remember being paged as I'm driving up Broadway to the hospital that morning to work, not having all this information that I just presented to you, but sounding like this sounds like, you guys know what this is, serotonin syndrome. Classic case, the, the, the classic case from New York, many, many years ago that the, where the young lady died from this adverse event. Um, every eMERGE physician, every person that manages mental illness knows that this drug interaction can, and can happen. MAOI inhibitors with meperidine is one of the most dangerous combinations. But it happened. And you can see how it happened. Think all the, the chain of events of things that happen, you get anchored on, I gotta manage this patient's pain. You don't go back and look at the profile. You use a drug that is not that commonly used anymore in eMERGE, but really guided you there by the patient and the family for not wanting the preferred drug class, and you end up having a serious adverse event, two days in the ICU, two more days on internal medicine, and the patient fortunately survived. But this event actually happened. And this patient had a, a triple whammy risk because they were also on lithium, um, lithium with meperidine uh, in combination with the MAOI inhibitor, which again is another risk because we don't use that drug class very often anymore. So you don't think as much as we did years ago when we used this drug class because it's not on our radar, but you still will read it's the most commonly associated drug for treating mental illness with drug interactions and food interactions and a whole series of other uh, concerns when you use this drug class. But it happened. So what are the risks? 
that patient was a, a drug-related presentation in itself, and then we had an iatrogenic drug-related admission because of something that we did to that patient. But who's at risk? And this cartoon is really a, a nice depiction over time of really what happens and to, to patients and who is at risk. Um, advanced age is, comes out as a top, as the, usually the, one of the greatest risk factors. And almost every study that looks at risk will tie the advancing age with increased risk of adverse events. More medications are used. There's more high-risk medications that are used. Physiologic changes with age predispose um, adverse events. Compliance becomes an issue for many reasons. Um, and so together, advanced age is, is a risk factor. Female gender. Now, I, I urge every male in the audience to not say anything at this point. <laughs> But I'm going to ask why female gender more at risk than males. And it's not grossly high. It's the studies. There's a, a smaller risk of females that come out in almost every adverse event study. And if any male speaks, you're on your own. <laughs> they live longer? No, that's not the reason. They do, though. That's a great answer. And that is probably a component. They're more likely to seek help. But there's a better answer. Smaller. Why that? Why is that important? Yeah, great. I wish I could give you a loony. Because <laughs> um, most people don't get this. It, it, it's because they are smaller. Here you go. Here's a loony. <laughs> we dose medications all the time on fixed doses. And for smaller people, they get higher milligram per kilogram doses. And so higher doses equal higher rate risk of adverse event, the dose-related phenomenon. And that's why females come out slightly on top, which is the next bullet item. Um, renal dysfunction is a big one, obviously, for drugs that are renally eliminated. There's a direct correlation in every study that's looked at this as the number of comorbidities and the number of medications a patient's receiving directly link and increased risk. And we saw this in our work. It's the estimates, I'll show you on the next slide, but there's somewhere between a, a 10 to 20% increased risk for every additional comorbidity and every additional drug that you're taking for the likelihood of having an adverse drug event. And then there's the particular drug classes. Um, sorry, I'll go back to this, that one slide. This is just some, work, some of the work that we had done that, that links comorbidities and medications. But one of the other factors is the number of prescribers. And you end up, for obvious reasons, having multiple prescribers, not necessarily always communicating with each other, in a system where we oftentimes don't see the full profiles for patients. So in a patient being prescribed medications from, for mental illness, maybe different from the patients that are prescribing other chronic diseases, and there may be other prescribers in the mix, but multiple prescribers in itself is a risk factor for adverse drug events. These are the drug classes that are most common. And I'm going to quickly walk through them because the focus is not on general practice today. Um, I'm going to quickly go through them, but I'm going to highlight some things to think about that are relevant to patients that are on these drugs that may be also be treated for, for mental illness. But 60 to 70% of the adverse drug events that we see in the work comes from these, these six drug classes. Um, the ED study, I skipped over the hospital admission study because it's a bit of a, not, not, not necessarily appropriate to talk about the drug mix because in the hospital in which it was, was done, I'll, I'll show it to you, the hospital in which it was done, the patients that were admitted for mental illness didn't actually go to this ward. So you wouldn't expect to see the drugs on this list related to mental, mental illness management. But the ED study was more telling in that the top two drug classes were antibiotics and opioids. But class number th three and class number four were antipsychotics and benzodiazepines, two commonly used drug classes in, in the patient population you care for. And antidepressants are also down on the list to a, to a lesser extent. But they were, were very prominently uh, there in our adverse event work um, as being a cause for the ED presentation. And in the pediatric study, central CNS active drugs actually made up about 20% of the visits. And you'll ask, well, what, what were they? Uh, a quarter of them were actually benzodiazepines that were the cause of, of the presentation for some way. And a lot of them were common, well-known side effects, mental status changes, but it was benzodiazepines as a common drug class, followed by antiepileptic drugs. 
And then there was a mix of other drugs that made up smaller percentages, including antidepressants and antipsychotics in kids. So quickly about these drug classes, uh, most likely to be preventable are the antibiotics. We are not going to withhold antibiotics from patients that need them. Um, the common adverse events, GI, allergic reactions, um, and the reasons are oftentimes adherence, wrong antibiotics, being on drug interactions, or having resistance to the, the agents in which you're using to treat, or the bugs that you're using to treat the antibiotic. Um, interestingly enough, in my practice, I've seen a number of patients present with antibiotic-induced psychosis, mania, and delirium. In an ED setting, they present, oftentimes there, there tends to be more males than females. I've seen about a dozen cases in my career of antibiotic-induced psychosis. And they tend to occur in the first couple of days of the initiation of antibiotics, but can occur later on in therapy. Anybody want to guess as to the drug class that's most common in this? There's about four or five different drug classes, but there is a drug class that comes out slightly on top. So phonamides is on the list. It's not number one, though. It's about the third most common. Yeah, the quinolones are number two. Ciprofloxin, well described. It's been described with levofloxin as well. But the clarithromycin-induced psychosis is the, com the most common cases that I've seen have been involving the macrolide class of antibiotics, specifically clarithromycin. And these, these are patients that do not have a history of mental illness. And they present. And so the discussion we had earlier about medical clearance versus do you go right to psychiatry, this is a relevant issue where your patient presents with what may appear to be a psychiatric presentation. But in fact, it, this is not, it is not a psychiatric uh, presentation. It's a psychiatric adverse event to an antibiotic. Anticoagulants, extremely common, extremely dangerous. High INRs, low INRs are very dangerous. Anticipating drug interactions is the big one, and there's a number of drugs that we use in mental illness that will impact the intensity of anticoagulation. Carbamazepine, valproic acid are common drug interactions with warfarin, and although you may not be managing the warfarin part of it, you are managing oftentimes the valproic acid, carbamazepine, that will result in drug interactions with, with the warfarin, particularly on initiation or discontinuation. So monitoring is key um, in this patient population. We all get worried, and I know I emotionally feel different when I see an INR that's too high versus an INR that's too low. But an INR that's too low is equally as dangerous as an INR that's too high. And this work that was done by Natalie Oak um, showed that 44% of all hemorrhagic complications occurred in patients where there was an INR that was too high, and 48% occurred in patients that had an INR that was too low for thromboembolic complications. So they, they carry the same risk of having an intensity of INR that's actually off, off kilter. Patients that present to the ED oftentimes have poorly managed anticoagulation. And so when we're managing acute mental illness, if we're also compounding this patient population's drug therapy with other drugs that will impact it, you're already dealing with a patient population that has poorly managed INR control. Only 43% of the patients that present to the ED actually have an INR in the therapeutic range. And 33, almost 34% are above. Diuretics, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, digoxin, common cardiovascular medications, but relevant to your patients because your patients oftentimes are managed on drugs that can compound this adverse event profile. Hypotension, issues of, of, of uh, exacerbating uh, and complicating adverse event profiles of drugs like lithium in the combination of, of diuretic use. Um, are commonly and well, well described um, that, yes, again, we're not managing the cardiovascular adverse events, but it may well be the combination of the beta blocker with the calcium channel blocker with the antipsychotic that may be resulting in your patient becoming ortho, experiencing hypotension or orthostatic hypotension. Hypoglycemics, I won't say much about that. There's not a significant link to the mental illness or psychiatric medications, but we're all well aware of the low blood sugar adverse events. Um, what's really alarming is the, comp the, the complications that result from the newer oral hypoglycemic agents, particularly around the fluid retention that we see with the glitazone class, um, which now is completely contraindicated in any patient with heart failure um, because of some of, the, some of the work that had been done that looks at numbers needed to harm for causing MI or heart failure in patients using that drug class versus other forms of oral hypoglycemics. And so we used to see for a whole series of, of years before these black box warnings were in place, patients present with acute decompensated heart failure 
that never really had severe heart failure to start, but are now sitting in acute fluid pulmonary edema in the ED after the initiation of this drug class. And so it, it is definitely of concern and something that you can historically see has changed with the manner in which we use this drug class in our population. And then finally, usually the number one, and certainly a drug that is used in every population is NSAIDs. And these are some statistics from the US that links uh, NSAID-related deaths. Oops, that's the wrong slide. Let's look at this one. The Canadian, the Arthritis Society of Canada, sorry, um, presented uh, linked NSAID-associated deaths in Canada as greater than MVAs, drownings, fires, and gunshots in our country. And almost combined, there it's it's greater than. So NSAIDs is, is a common risk, and it's a drug class that your patients, every other chronic disease, and every other patient uh, is oftentimes exposed to that does place with that at risk. We're all well aware of the GI complications. We're well aware of, of some of the other things that can result from renal dysfunction, worsening heart failure, allergic reactions. But we, d we have seen cases where the drug interaction because of worsening real dysfunction precipitates a lithium toxicity. And the patient presents it with lithium toxicity, but it's because you've knocked off their renal function and they have acute kidney in injury because of the acute initiation of an NSAID. And so COX-2s, and there's, the celecoxib is, is really the, the prototype here that we're, we're talking about, um, carries the same risk in this regard as your traditional non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. So back to the ED study that we looked at for mental, for psychiatric medications. In this particular study of the 90,000 some odd visits each year that are linked in this database, um, the sedative hypnotics made up about 34%, the antidepressants about 28%, antipsychotics about 24%, and lithium about 4%. But if you look at the second bit of data, um, it's actually the number of events per outpatient pres prescriptions written. So even though the sedatives were highest on the list as a general representation amongst the population, it w represented a smaller population compared to the number of prescriptions that were written for benzodiazepines in this data set. Whereas if you look down the list, the lithium and the antipsychotics were at a higher rate comparative to the number of prescriptions that were actually written for this drug or drug class. And the types of adverse events, and this is one of the take home messages from, the, from today that I'll, I'll talk about in the next couple of slides, is the events that you're going to see are going to be the things that you expect to see. The adverse events are not weird and wonderful. They're the common adverse events that you are all well aware of that can happen with the use of these drug classes. And this is exactly what they saw here. The adverse events from a sedative hypnotic group were altered mental status or changes in mental status. Um, antidepressants, hypersensitivity, sensory disturbances, movement disorders, the most common presentation and adverse event for the patients in this group that presented with antipsychotics, and the lithium were neurological symptoms because of an elevated level of lithium. And so the, the, the take home on this is don't, don't always, don't think that there has to be a weird and wonderful adverse event. It's the common ones that you're gonna see that are presenting, and it's exactly what we've seen in, in all of our work and I think the same holds true. So a couple of things specific to psychiatric medication adverse events. Um, most of these adverse events that you're going to see are going to be seen in an outpatient setting. It's not going to be in the ED. And the patients that, the, the title of the talk is, you know, what makes an adverse event an emergency? Well, it's usually an emergency because the patient is deemed it to that, that's where they need to get their care. It doesn't necessarily mean that emergency means life-threatening or, or, or something of that nature, it, but it's important enough for the patient that they feel that their point of contact to get their symptom or adverse event managed is the ED. And many of these adverse events are no different than the patients that you may see in your office or in your clinic. Um, they just are seen at a different point in time, uh, at a different contact to the system. Um, the, most of the adverse events will also be minor in severity. So emergency also doesn't mean something really bad is going to happen, although that can be the case. Fortunately, in all the adverse event work that I've done, no one has ever died in one of my studies, and hopefully never does. So most of these events are not patients that actually succumb to the adverse event that they experience, but are going to be minor in nature, and oftentimes will be a minimal period of time where you have symptom, symptomatology, an abnormality in the lab, but not something that's resulting in non-permanent disability or death, permanent disability or death. But some events can be life-threatening 
And I presented you the case of the serotonin syndrome. That's a great example that if you're doing a, a talk on the top 10 most dangerous drug interactions, that's one of them that's on the list. Because people have died from that drug interaction. And it is one of those dangerous ones. Neuroleptic malign malignant syndrome, rare. I've never seen a case of neuroleptic malignant syndrome in all the years I've worked in eMERGE. Lots of serotonin syndromes, but I've never seen a case of neuroleptic malignant syndrome, and I'm hoping I never, I never do. Um, hematologic complications, we're all, you're all well aware of what we do for drugs like clozapine um, with a monitoring for hematologic complications, um, and that monitoring does prevent a serious adverse event from occurring in the population that is at risk. Dermatologic eruptions are well described with certain drug classes. Um, carbamazepine often gets a bad rap in, in this group of psychotropic medications um, because it has been associated with life-threatening Stephen Johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal necrolysis, but dermatologic eruptions can happen with any drug class. QT prolongation. Oftentimes, it's the tricyclic antidepressants that get associated with it. The second generation antipsychotics have a slightly increased risk, lithium. Um, but QT prolongation is something that can be monitored. And there's some risks, and I'll show you them on, a, on the next slide, about what those risks might be. The controversies around suicidality and drug use. And I know that there's, there's data that comes out every day. I think most recently I've seen data that has come out for drugs for the use of and treatment of ADHD. Um, and a Health Canada risk around suicidality in that drug class. But there's obviously a risk there that this is an adverse event. If the drug makes the patient have suicidal ideation, then that is an adverse event of that medication. Seizures uh, and psychosis uh, are two other common presentations um, that may result from the use of psychotropic drugs. And in the psychosis line, um, drug, other drugs that are non-psychiatric medications that can actually cause psychosis. And you can only imagine the number of cases we saw at the QE2 when varenicline first came on the market and patients were using that drug class for smoking cessation and patients were presenting to the ED acutely psychotic from this drug class. The same thing that happened when bupropion first came on the market and we had patients present to the ED with seizures. And clearly there's a link and a dose association between using bupropion and seizure onset that we well, are now well know and, are, and try to keep the doses down. But those are two good examples of drugs that have adverse events associated to them that you didn't necessarily expect when they were first actually marketed and used in this patient population. I show this slide only for illustrative purposes. These, you will see many of these types of slides that talk about cytochrome P450 drug interactions to help predict whether or not a drug that you're using in your patient may interact with other drugs that they have on their profile. And I don't attempt, even as a pharmacist that manages and cares for uh, patients and deals primarily with drug-related drug issues, I do not attempt to memorize these lists. But these are lists that are useful, particularly to know the common types of drugs that will interact um, through this mechanism of me metabolic uh, either inhibition or uh, induction. Um, and, and really you can, you can try to predict or at least monitor uh, more closely patients where this combination may be putting your patient at risk. I've already mentioned QT prolongation and here's a, a, a list of some drugs. This is a, from a Canadian refer, uh, US reference. So some of these drugs I know are not available in, can, in Canada, but just gives you a sense of, for some of the drugs that have been associated with QT prolongation. And below talks about some of the general risks of patients experiencing QT prolongation um, which does also include the female gender, uh, electrolyte abnormalities, pre-existing bradycardia, being on concomitant QT prolonging drugs, uh, having heart failure, um, and having a long baseline QT. So there's a re website here that I use regularly in my practice where I've got a patient where I don't have one of those obvious QT prolonging drugs on board, but the QT is prolonged, should I be concerned? Um, credible meds. This website's changed names about five times in the last five years, but it's now the current source for, that I go to when I try to figure out whether my drug is causing QT prolongation. Last case, and then we'll, we'll wrap up with the, with the final objective. This is another case uh, that was here at the QE2. 48-year-old uh, female presented to the ED with her husband, a toxic, incoordinated weakness and a headache, had a history of symptoms that began 48 hours prior to presentation, but had become progressively worse. No nausea and vomiting, no confusion, no slurred speech, no chest pain. 
Um, patient had a very extensive medication history, and, and I'm going to show you the next slide with the med, meds on it um, in a second. Don't try to memorize it. I'll bring it back up when I ask you what you think is going on um, with this patient. But there's the med list. That's more long. And by all intensive statistics, this patient, if you looked real hard, whether regardless, I know, you know I'm showing you this because there's an adverse event here, but the fact that this list would have been attained in triage would have predicted this patient has some form of an adverse event because of the number of meds. Lots of meds on this profile. I'll come back to this list. Physical exam was not that remarkable. Lateral nystagma is ataxic and uncoordinated from a physical exam. The labs, um, not with a normal limits from a CBC and lights, the shim was 137 um, with a creatinine clearance of 50. Uh, ECG was fine, CT ahead with no acute changes. And so we were working, I had a resident with me at the time and I had Sam Campbell was the, was the staff EP and asked us to take a look at this patient to figure out what was going on. And since I had a resident, this was a perfect case for a resident to look at with all these meds. Um, and when you review the list, and I, just for the sake of time, um, when you look at this patient's serum creatinine, two things happen with this patient. Uh, is this, what, what do you think the presentation from their meds presents? The symptomatology and the meds, and there's lots of meds that may cause this, but if you had to, if you were betting on what drug is causing that patient to present with ataxia and coordination, what drug would you bet on on the list? Gabapentin. And, and gabapentin is, is, is there, it becomes the culprit and the, and the target here for a number of reasons. The symptomatology matches what you're expecting to see at, at, with gabapentin, but also in a patient that has this dose of gabapentin on board. That's a big dose of gabapentin. The other part of this story that I didn't tell you is that this celecoxib had just been started. And even though I, I showed you on the previous slide, whoops, even though I showed you on the previous slide that this serum creatinine, which most of us wouldn't even blink an eye at, that's fine, had actually doubled since the patient started celecoxib. So a very, very small change in a, the renal function with a high dose of gabapentin caused this presentation. So and, and how do you know? We followed this patient for learning purposes. This resident followed this patient for several days after being discharged from the eMERGE with alterations in their gabapentin and nothing else. These symptoms completely went away. And so fo that follow-up is extremely important. And again, another example of what can happen when you alter a system like renal function that impacts a whole series of drugs, including many of the drugs that are renally eliminated that are care used for caring, patients, caring for patients with mental illness. The last objective, to discuss strategies. So we all want to know, well, what can we do? We know our patients are at risk. We know some of the risk factors and some of the drugs and things to expect, but what can we do? And if we had the answer, I wouldn't be here today. Um, and I hopefully, we'd love to find the answer, but it's very complex because the solution to some of these problems are different um, and they're multimodal with regards to their approach. And they involve more than just one healthcare provider. This isn't a physician issue. This isn't a pharmacist issue. This isn't a nurse issue. This isn't a patient issue. It's everybody working together to try to get at the reasons by which some of these adverse events occur. And one of the reasons I showed you the very first case is because everybody involved in that patient's care, including the patient, were at fault for that happening equally. And I'll come back to it and explain it to you, but what can we do? And I could make a big long list of things that we could do, could do um, but I've actually narrowed it down to four big issues. And one of them is evidence-based collaborative practice, uh, adherence, issues of monitoring, and issues of communication. And I feel that if we really are purposeful in our approach to managing patients' pharmacotherapy in this manner, we will get at the 50 to 70% of preventable cases. We're always going to have the cases that happen that can't be prevented. But let's get out the 50 to 70% that are preventable. Evidence-based practice. Mental health in care, at least in the, in the mental health teams that I've seen here at the, in Halifax, in my current practice in Vancouver General, are truly teams. And it's one of the reasons I love working in Emerge because I feel I work in a team of a whole series of healthcare providers with a goal in mind to improve that patient's care. And evidence-based practice does involve a team. 
And there's a whole series, particularly in, in, in the daily activities of your practice that have things to do with meds or not meds, social work issues, economic issues, other family dynamics, a whole series of things that directly impact a patient's ability to get good evidence-based care. And so I, I'm a completely strong proponent of team-based care, and I think that mental illness and mental health delivery in our country is probably a great example of how team-based care is absolutely necessary to get at these issues. But we make therapy drug, when it comes to drug therapy decisions, um, as part of that team-based care, we use a whole series of things to come up with the best options for patients. And obviously this is, looks like it's equal codependent parts, but the evidence base really is what should guide our decisions. Using best practice and best evidence to get our patients on the drugs that we, will, we can predict more readily that we will get a good outcome and hopefully not a bad outcome or an adverse event. But that obviously has to be balanced with our clinical experience, our patient preferences. And then what we oftentimes defer to is the pathophysiologic reasoning as to why we use drugs. And I can get into a whole, your colleague David Gardner can, probably has talked to you about this before, about the fact that does it really matter how the drug works? Because sometimes the drug works for a reason that we have no idea why it works. It just works. Or it works for a reason that is not congruent with the actual mechanism of action of that drug. So who cares about how it works? But our students will oftentimes defer when they're talking to patients. They will often start here. Your drug, this is a drug that's used for this, and this is how it works. And that's OK. But to me, this is the least important of the decision-making factors about drug therapy. Um, it should fall from the evidence-based practice and patient preference. Just a couple of pearls on, on this. Individualization of therapy is extremely important, and putting that patient in, on the best, best regimen for them is, is an obvious one. Being aware of high-risk drugs and high-risk patients, and I've talked to you a little bit today about what some of those high-risk drugs might be. Um, some of those high-risk patients' characteristics um, are, are true regardless of, of the patient population in which we're caring for. Duplication of therapy continues to be a problem. I still see patients on three different benzos and two different NSAIDs. And a whole series of the, the anticholinergic burden that patients have because of the combination of drugs that actually have anticholinergic side effects. So we can do a better, still do a better job with duplications of therapy. Anticipating drug interactions. Interestingly enough, in all the work we've done, drug interactions hasn't been prominent as the reasons patients present. It's the other drug classes. But drug interactions um, are something that we should be aware of. And in situations where we know we've got something that's potentially problematic that we can avoid, avoid it. Many times we can't, and that requires more monitoring. And it's okay to have a patient on a drug interaction. Just monitor it appropriately to catch it before it becomes more significant clinically. Being aware of adverse drug-related events related to discontinuation and withdrawal. And this is per per preferably relevant in the, in the populations that you care for because you're always switching drugs or altering drugs. And we have withdrawal syndromes and we have tapering regimens and switching regimens that are very well tabulated and documented in, in um, various places around how to do that for patients with mental illness. But patients can have exacerbations of their disease during this tapering and withdrawal period that are relevant and are adverse drug events. If you don't need it, don't start it. If it's not working, stop it. We're awesome at starting drugs. We are awesome at starting drugs. But deprescribing the current term that's kind of making its way Ontario centrally uh, outwards um, is, is, the, is the way in which we now to start, have to start more purposefully about deprescribing drugs. Patients don't oftentimes need all these drugs that they're started on. And we are very, very um, guilty of starting drugs and not really thinking about, is that really working? And do they actually still need this drug after a period of time has passed or the reason for which it was used is, has gone? And the final piece on this slide is new is not equal better. It rarely actually equals better, um, but it always means we don't know yet about adverse drug events and drug interactions. Always means that. And I can show you lists of drugs that have been withdrawn from the Canadian market in the last couple of decades, some of which are in the mental health uh, armamentarium that have been withdrawn because of things that we found post-marketing. This is a study from the US that looks at drugs up to 1999, and I'll show you a more updated slide next, but in general, over the course of over a 25, this is a Kaplan-Meier that they developed for, for this um, estimate of a drug actually getting withdrawn from market or having a black box warning applied to it after marketing. 
and you get about a 25% chance of that happening. So a quarter of the drugs that come out that are new, something will go bad with that drug that we find out after the drug has been marketed and used. And hospitals, here's a plug for hospitals. Hospital formularies often get criticized for not adding new drugs to formulary. And usually it's like it costs too much money. That's part of it. Part of it is the fact that it's oftentimes not better than what we already have. But one of the things that that process does allow is to not get into this situation. And there's lots of drug examples of things that never got added to a formulary and two years later didn't exist on the market because of an adverse event. So the, the, the processes that we have in our formulary system in, in hospitals sometimes is beneficial to our patients. Um, this is just a more up-to-date, and I don't want you to focus on this one, but this is just, uh, again, a black box warning application to drugs. And you'll notice a spike here in 2004, and you'll start to see here a, a higher rates of black box warnings applied to drugs up to 2013. What happened in 2004 to cause the spike? Does anybody remember a significant post-marketing? Pardon? Uh, no. Nope. That's maybe contributing as well, but the, the, but the main spike is caused by another drug class. But that's a good one, though. That's a good one as well. Rofococcid. Remember Rofococcid, the controversy of Rofococcid, knowing the data around some of the harms of Rofococcid that did not actually come to light, and that drug now no longer is with us. Um, but that was what caused this increased surveillance and black box warning application um, after 2004. But I, I actually get, agree with your SSRI comment as well. That's another one that likely contributed to that. Adherence, big, big issue. And I know it's a big issue in patients that are treated for mental illness. It's a, it's a big issue, though, in patients treated for chronic disease as well. And drugs don't work for patients who don't take them and take them the way that they're supposed to be used. These are two studies that are, when I show these to our, my pharmacy colleagues and our pharmacy students, they feel depressed because we're always teaching our students how to counsel our patients on how to take their medications properly and, and how to properly educate patients on their use. But these two studies look at effective approaches to improving medication adherence in patients with chronic diseases, including patients with mental illness. And the first systematic review said that counseling, monitoring, education shows minor effects in some studies and none in others, while the evidence is weak to support any particular recommendation for pharmacist interventions. So what we teach our students is completely useless. The second study, current methods of improving medication adherence for chronic disease problems are mostly complex, labor-intensive, and not particularly effective. So that's kind of depressing. But then you see a study like this come out where it's a, and I hate the title because it, it sounds like it was just you call the patient, you bug the heck out of them to take their meds. But this is a study done in, in Hong Kong in a highly uh, non-adherent patient population, polypharmacy, high risk, and they randomized them to an intensive intervention, which they call telephone intervention, and it wasn't just telephone intervention. It was a whole series of things, chronic disease management, adherence counseling, follow-up, a whole series of things, and compared them to just hope for the best. And they found that there was a, an absolute risk reduction of 6%, never needed to treat of 17 for the reduction of mortality in patients that had the intensive intervention. But I just showed you on the previous slide that all the stuff we do actually makes no difference. So what's the difference? The difference is in the study they provided care to patients. They didn't just give the patient a font size six of a patient monograph that they couldn't understand or couldn't read and gave them a two minute blurb on how to take their meds and why they should take their meds because that doesn't work. But what does work is a comprehensive approach to care for patients in which you actually do a whole series of things including proactive follow-up, disease management, monitoring, working in a team-based environment to actually make all those components that the previous slide said were complex, but complex means necessary to actually make a difference, and in this case, reduce mortality. So it's not actually as simple as this. It's far more complicated than this. And anyone that thinks that, and I think people are starting to realize that adherence is a big issue. It consumes a major resources, and outcomes are not achieved. Um, outcomes are not achieved in patients that actually don't take their meds. And I could show you lots of slides, and I don't have them here in this set, but lots of slides that show you that when patients don't take proven therapies, their outcomes are not what you would expect them to be if they did, in fact, take those proven therapies. Last couple slides. Monitoring is, is critical. 
Um, there's lots of examples of the monitoring, and I'm not talking about blood level monitoring, that's one form of monitoring, but proactive follow-up monitoring can catch these adverse events and intervene on them before they become serious enough to actually come to an ED or even come to a healthcare provider in an outpatient setting. So sometimes it's as simple as a phone follow-up or sometimes it's a scheduled appointment to uh, manage and figure out whether or not the medication regimen that they're on or have just been prescribed is effective or actually causing harm. This actually made the news in, in, a, in a program that where they actually did follow up patients. Um, this was being done in a community and pharmacy environment, but patients were followed up um, to resolve drug-related issues or reactions that occurred and found to significantly impact the number of patients that went on to get a more serious adverse event and result in another healthcare contact to a hospital or an ED. And then the final piece is communication. We do a very terrible job in our system with communicating with each other. And I'm not talking necessarily with each other here in the room. I'm talking about acute care connecting with community care, the providers in community care connecting with each other, even the providers in the acute care setting connecting with each other. And sometimes there's gaps in communication are the result of the patient actually having an adverse event because things just get missed. The monitoring doesn't get done. The follow-up doesn't get done. In my practice, when I'm, one of the common things that always makes me nervous is when I see a patient in ED for a pain management issue and I send them home on a new regimen that I know needs to be followed up in 24 hours or 48 hours to figure out the changes that we made in the eMERGE matter to that patient. Are they having harm? But I have to rely on the communication by a colleague, a family physician, a specialist in the community that can do a great job, but sometimes it's always worried about is it going to actually happen? Because if it doesn't happen, something bad could happen to this patient or they could actually not get the, the benefit that we're attempting to achieve. So communication is key. I'll show you this one study. I won't show you the whole study. I'll just tell you about, this was a study that was done in Ontario um, that looked at information exchange between physicians. And this was a physician to physician study of information that was obtained between physicians that cared for patients in an inpatient setting and was it transferred back to the family doc. And you know, I'm in an environment where I always see discharge summaries being done and I assume they're going to the family physician from, from the inpatient care team. But the results of the study is that healthcare information is often not shared. Only 17% of the patients, of the physicians in this group, the GP side, received the information from what happened in hospital care. Now, that summary seemed really low to me, but that's what they reported, and this was an Ottawa-based study. Um, of poor communication between acute care and chronic care. So if, if we did this for any healthcare provider, I could show you this pharmacist to pharmacist, it's probably worse than 17%. But we just need to be better at communicating amongst all the people in the system. I'll wrap up by coming back to the case I started you with. That patient experienced what continues to be a persistent adverse event because of using a drug they should have probably, if they should have never been prescribed at that, at that dose, should have never been dispensed. And this, this patient, actually, the, 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 the remaining parts of the story, and I'll close, is this patient had been on statins her whole life and had been on every single statin that had ever been on the market. And she had had myopathies and myalgias every single time she switched, every single time she's actually changed doses. This is a normal thing for her. She had a standing order from her family, from her cardiologist to get lab monitoring done when this happened. She normally got it done. She got it done so many times with no issue that when it happened again, she said, no, nah, this will just go away like it does every other time. The guidelines for cardiovascular management of lipids at the time changed from an LDL target from two and a half down to two. So there was more aggressive approaches to try to get the, treat the number. And so this was also at the time where this dose was doubled to try to go after a number. And a patient LDL was 2.3, they were going after to get it down to two. So there was a consult note written by the cardiologist to prescribe the 80 milligram dose. The pharmacist called on it and the cardiologist said, continue to, to dispense the drug and it was dispensed. So whose fault is it? It's everyone's fault. And the reality is, is that it's not an issue of blame. It's an issue of learning about how we can actually get at these problems. This is a, there's a whole, we could talk for, we could talk for a whole hour just on this case, but this is a systems issue that involves the patient, the providers, and everyone involved in the case to try to actually get at these problems. Because this lady, I'm sure, if you were to go back, the pharmacist, the physicians involved, would do things differently knowing that this happened to this patient. 
So there's a long road ahead. Adverse events is, a, is a certainly an interesting area. That, and in, in mental health, health, there's a large opportunity to do work. Um, I wish I could have shown you very specific things around mental health and adverse events, particularly around epidemiology. Um, but there's just not, there's nothing out there uh, that, that, is, that I, can, I can show you. There's lots of work that is being done by very many people in the country um, that are attempting to make drug therapy safer for patients um, and will continue to do so. I hope I've been able to accomplish my objectives today that I've set out to do. Um, and I, again, thank you very much for the honor of actually presenting to you today. And uh, I'm happy with the chair's permission to answer any questions. Hi, good morning. Hi. That was an excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if you've studied at all or found research on uh, long-acting uh, injections with adverse events uh, coming to the emergency, um, as well as you can touch a bit more on that collaborative care. Mm. Um, I'm a nurse, so I find it very difficult when I approach my physicians uh, and I have concern, but I find the ultimate responsibility is with the physician. Um, and it's really hard to go against their, their judgment. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of that collaborative care, uh, and you were mentioning it's everybody's responsibility, yet, yeah. as you mentioned, even the pharmacist questioned it. Yeah. Um, so I'm just wondering in terms of how can we improve yeah that collaborative I, care as well. So I think it's a great, questions. to answer your first question, I can't give you anything specific about depot injections or long acting okay. uh, injections. Nothing that I found that was specifically relevant that would highlight anything that's not already known around the risks that are associated with the drug classes that are delivered by IM depot injection. The collaborative care issue is, is an interesting one in my, in, my other, in my other administrative job at UBC around practice innovation. One of the things that I'm charged with is to try to develop new models of care that actually focus on team-based care delivery. And it, it seems weird that that's coming from a university's perspective, but it really is a movement that we're seeing um, in many jurisdictions in which ministries of health are attempting to deliver more sustainable healthcare models. And part of that is linking the good outcomes that are associated with the, 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 the delivery systems that exist in those environments. And, and what is coming out from many jurisdictions is that team-based collaborative care is what's best for patient outcomes. So the issue of who, will, who owns the patient, well the patient owns the patient and we are helping the patient get good outcomes as a team. And whether you're a pharmacist or a nurse or a physician or social worker or dietitian, it doesn't matter what role you play, if the goal is to ultimately come together to a common set of goals for what is the best outcome for this patient, then divergence in a approach might be slightly different or ways in which you might get to that goal might be slightly different, but I think at least having a, an avenue to work together to get those outcomes has been what the literature would suggest is the best thing for patients. And so I, I totally hear your, your, what you're saying about sometimes there's divergence in, in the way that we collaborate. Um, one of the things I love about Emerge is that sometimes, you can't tell sometimes who's who. You can't tell who's who. You, you can ultimately, but when you're there working together for the goal of resuscitating a patient or managing this acute MI or so, you, you sometimes can't actually differentiate what we're, what, who's doing what because you're all working to the same goal. And so I hear what you're saying and there's obviously still challenges. Thank you for your talk. I, I work with adolescents and, and children, so the medication lists that you had in your cases just are still so surprising to me. Yeah. It's been a long time since I've treated people with that many. But is there an advantage to promoting among residents your training the use of drug interaction programs? And um, are they utilized equally across settings, yeah. like emergency care and outpatient? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. And, and you know, one of the, I, I thought very differently about drug interactions over the years, partly informed by the research, because we all know lots of different drug interactions that can occur. But most of what, what I think we find is that we hear about the, the exception cases that result in something bad happening. But when you actually look at the whole distribution of 
the reasons by which things go wrong. Drug interactions is way down the list as to the reason why something bad went wrong. Mm -hmm. My approach to that is that we need to know what drugs will commonly interact. And I always pr report that for the ones that you have serious, serious complications that can result from a drug interaction, and I'm thinking of things like antibiotics combined with warfarin. Mm -hmm. um, the, the serotonin syndrome reaction is another great one. You know, you give that patient meperidine in the setting of an MAY, that's a dangerous drug interaction. Mm -hmm. I think healthcare providers need to know where to, where to go from a resource to appreciate what is possible, what is the likely severity of the drug interaction, mm -hmm. should it happen? And many times what you're gonna find is either nothing happens with changing the regimen, but just the monitoring has to be more diligent to mm -hmm. catch it if in mm -hmm. fact it, it does take place. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it's, it's, it, it's an interesting area that I think we probably focus on with our little smartphones and our, our various systems of when we dispense drugs that flag drug interactions. Um, but many times it's flagging all drug interactions and many of them are actually clinically irrelevant. And right. so appreciating the difference between common and serious mm -hmm. um, are important. And I, but I do think healthcare providers should know where to go to look for drug interactions. The one we use at Dalhousie now, it's been upgraded over the mm -hmm. last two years, does give both the, the strength of the interaction and reliability yeah. rating as well as the recommended management. Yeah. So those are quite helpful. But I guess for anyone in private practice in the community, those programs cost $200 yeah. a year or more. So Absolutely. it'd be useful to know that the, for people here that the district health authorities do have these yeah. for free. That's good. Thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Said, uh, recognizing the effectiveness of the collaborative care in terms of outcome, I'm very interested to know what the costs are in the United States when the community health, uh, mental health movement started. Research showed that the classical collaboration, uh, people of different professions working in a team, nurse, social worker, psychologist, psychiatrist, proved to be very expensive. Is it similar in what you're talking about? Yeah, I think, I think it, that's a, a, not an easy question to answer because I think in the models that we're working on, I can, give you, I can give you the BC experience of what's happening now, is that we're working on models now in a province where the primary care teams are not established. So for those of you that are here from Ontario or from Ontario, you know that the family health care team model has been established there for many years, since the early 2000s, and have integrated health care providers together in prim primary care. But in BC, those, those teams don't exist. And so it's it, the, the models and the, and the remuneration models uh, for developing team-based care in BC is just redeploying funds that were in other sectors to try to create those teams in a different environment. So the models, at least the ones I'm working on, will, will not be expensive in the sense that the dollars are just being shifted. But I completely appreciate that if you're creating something new and adding it on to the existing system, that there's an inherent cost associated with that. Um, I guess the belief is that the outcomes that would be achieved would offset those costs by having better outcomes for your patients and less ED visits and less utilization of acute care services because patients are managed in the community or in primary care environments better um, should offset some of the cost of building those primary health care teams. But certainly different jurisdictions are going to have different uh, models and economic impact to creating those teams. No question. Good question. question. I gave you a loony, so you have to be very gentle. Oh, I, I was not, gonna, not only going to be gentle, I was going to thank you. I mean, it was so accessible that even though as a social worker I can't spell half the things that you said, I, I, I think I got some really important information. And um, I don't expect your talk to be all things to all people, but I work with a client population with a high level of antidepressant use, but also a high level of cannabis use at the same time. So I'm, I'm interested and these are not inpatients, but family prescribed uh, antidepressants. Um, and then the second group of people I'm, I'm interested in terms of uh, some of what you talked about is the increasing number of people and the huge industry in uh, herbal and vitamin interaction. I wonder if you could comment on those yeah. two. Thank you. I, I think th your first question about the impact of cannabis is, is Dr. Gosselin here? Shh. Oh, Sophie's right there in the back. So I think Sophie, I, Sophie, are you going to talk about cannabis in the context of your talk this afternoon? Yeah. 
Yeah, so Sophie's talk this afternoon is going to focus more on the recreational side. So I think it's, I'll leave that question to her because she can give you probably a much more intelligent sounding answer than I will. Um, because the focus of mine obviously was not on recreational drug use, but certainly the drug interactions and the drug interactions and some of the risks that occur with complementary and alternative medicines, and I'll use that term, because I know there's many different terms that people will use, um, are problematic. And we see things like the, the drug interactions that can result from drugs like St. John's Ward that, that interact with a whole bunch of things and is not a clean drug from that perspective. The, 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 the one thing about that drug class is that patients are often reluctant to tell you that they're even on them. And so one of the challenges is to actually get that patient to tell you honestly what they're taking. And you have to ask those questions. This is, I guess, the art of history taking in that this, the, so patients don't see those as drugs. So you have to ask them the questions in a, a number of different ways to get them to reveal to you what in fact they're taking on a complementary and alternative medicine perspective. And some of those drugs, are fine, but some of those drugs do have implications to adverse events, and some of those drugs do have a risk of, of drug interactions. And so I think from that perspective, I think we, if we could start with getting patients to reveal um, their, their profile and not actually feel that they have to hide it, because it shouldn't be a secret, um, that that's a, a long way to go to start to consider how that is impacting that patient's overall health and help to educate them on whether or not they should continue or not, or on what circumstances they should continue um, the use of, of that, that form of therapy. But it's a good question, a big challenge, um, particularly in the population of patients that I deal with in Vancouver, where there's a large Asian population that does use a lot of complementary and alternative medications as part of their care. And uh, there's nothing wrong with that, I think, but their willingness to share that as part of our understanding is, is a key part of us being able to help them as a healthcare provider. Good question.